Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is October 18th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast is Boeing, Taking Off or Nosediving. That will be the main crux of our conversation here on today's podcast. If you recall, we did a podcast a week, week and a half ago that was titled GE and GM Trouble at the Plant. And we were also discussing Boeing during that podcast as well, because are we going to find ourselves in the midst of a potential industrial collapse or contraction? And we said these are the big companies to be on the lookout for. They're not getting a huge bunch of coverage in the mainstream media. Of course, they're talked about because these are some some of the biggest names out there. These are household names with household appliances, things that everybody uses or knows about. So I said, keep these things fresh in your mind because we had a couple of months ago, we had the forensic accountant come out and issue a severe warning against General Electric, basically alleging that they are committing uh, accounting fraud. We have GM and the whole auto sector, the global auto sector that is in a massive slowdown. And you also have General Motors in conjunction with the UAW on strike. So you have that continuing. Now, there might be a tentative deal with the UAW and GM. We're waiting on the 46 to 50,000 GM employees to ratify that tentative deal if they want to go for it. Now, they might get higher wages. They might get some better benefits. But GM is still going to be allowed to close up to three plants across the country. So we'll keep you updated on that. But the other part of that podcast was a discussion pertaining to Boeing, because at the time there was some news that was crossing the wires that was stating that pilots from Southwest Airlines were filing suit against Boeing for lost wages. And the reason you saw sort of the uproar from Southwest is because Southwest only purchases 737s. And that is what is in question here. And of course, this is the 737 MAX 8 aircraft that is the new model from Boeing. Well, given the recent plane crashes, two plane crashes that took place last year within five, six months of each other, these planes have been grounded all over the world. And we continue to see a delay after delay after delay as to when these planes will become airborne once again. Well, there's another twist to this story that we're going to talk about here, but we said be mindful of this because if Boeing cut corners, if they put profits and revenue ahead of safety, if this should be true, if this should come to pass, this is going to cause a major, major hiccup in this economy in the United States, if not globally. I mean, this could be akin to a layman-like collapse in 08, 09, and I am not exaggerating, I'm not being hyperbolic, and we're going to walk through why that could be the case. But instead of it being on the financial side with Lehman Brothers and the banks, this could be an industrial manufacturing collapse. That's how big Boeing is. They are the largest U.S. exporter. And when you talk about aviation competition, you really only have Airbus out of Europe and Boeing here in the United States. So, you know, like I said a couple weeks ago or whenever that podcast was, this isn't an iPhone. You break it, you go get a new one, no big deal. Okay, you're not happy about it, but nobody's dead. Boeing, they make airplanes. They make a mistake, people die. And we've had people die. Now, I'm not laying all this at the feet of Boeing, but we're going to talk about this, and it may come to pass that a lot of this responsibility is going to fall at the feet of Boeing. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the markets here because there was some more movement in the markets. And of course, what uh, transpired today in regards to Boeing was was some of the reason for the down day in the markets. But we have the S&P down 12 points. The Dow gave back 256 points, a loss of 9, I'm sorry, 0.95%. The Nasdaq lost 67 points, a loss of 0.8% for the day. And the Russell 2000, the small cap index, gave back six points, a loss of four-tenths of 1%. The Dow Jones Transports was up slightly one-tenth of 1%, and the New York Stock Exchange gave back 0.25% for the day. Now, in regards to the Dow, major components that caused it to sell off. Microsoft lost 1.6% for the day. Johnson & Johnson lost 6 for the day, and Boeing, the granddaddy of them all today, lost 
0.8% on the day alone. Now, nevertheless, given these major companies suffering some sizable losses for the day, particularly Johnson & Johnson and Boeing, and even Microsoft losing 1.6%, the Dow was only down 0.95%, not even a full percent. And there wasn't anything really else in the, in, in the list of Dow 30 that's really striking me that says, well, we really counteracted that. Uh, so something's going on here. But nevertheless, that's what it is. Oil, we have WTI trading at $53.80 a barrel. Brent, the international metric, gave back 1% for the day and is at $59.15 a barrel. Gold and silver are relatively unchanged. We have gold trading at $1,491 an ounce. Silver is at $17.55 an ounce. Folks, buy low, sell high. I still believe with all of the shenanigans taking place with governments, with central bankers, that these fiat currencies, uh, they're just setting themselves up for failure. And just as, a, as, a, as protection to your portfolio, as diversification for your portfolio, please study this and please look into having some precious metals, uh, either physical bullion, bars, coins, uh, ETFs, owning the miners, something. Please look into it. We have the U.S. 10-year Treasury, uh, slightly down, but at one, yielding at 1.75%. And we have the VIX, the volatility index, gaining three percentage points for the day and is now trading at $14.25. So that's the markets. Uh, I am going to take the time today when we get to the discussion on Boeing to read an article to you in its entirety, uh, somewhat lengthy, uh, but I think it's important to read all of it because it's from the Wall Street Journal. It's an in-depth article, but I, I think it's imperative that we walk through this as we have with other you know, articles and and things that might have been released, transcripts and the like. But I, I think this rises to something of that detail because, you know, I wasn't certain, you know, when we did that podcast a week or two ago, but I said, you know, my spider senses were on high alert, that something just didn't smell right here, that you continue to have delay after delay as to when this plane is going to get approved to be operational again, and then you have pilots suing Boeing for lost wages. And I said, could this start to spiral? Because if it proves that this is a structural issue and not just a software issue, meaning an engineering issue, that this thing shouldn't be in the air, that you're going to have massive lawsuits. And again, just sort of with the theme of the day, uh, Johnson & Johnson is down in large part because of the mounting lawsuits that keep stemming on top of them, which not too long ago, we talked about Purdue Pharma going bankrupt. That was the manufacturer of OxyContin because you have states, communities, and families and individuals suing Oxy, uh, Purdue Pharma for the addiction, for the crisis that we have here in this country with the opioid addiction and the opioid crisis. So that put them out of business. So don't be surprised, despite the fact that obviously Johnson & Johnson and Boeing are much larger than Purdue Pharma, never be surprised how much the legal system can bring down these companies. And if it's fraud, if it's causing crises, if it's causing death, well, you know, then rightly so. Justice needs to be served. These people, these corporations are not above the law either. So we'll keep you posted on that. But before we get to that story, uh, a couple of things I do want to touch upon. Uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, a cat fight, if I can say that. Yes, I can say that. Between Tulsi Gabbard, Congresswoman and Democratic presidential contender from Hawaii, versus Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton sort of, she didn't, she didn't out Tulsi Gabbard by name in her statement and in her tweet, but talking about that the, the, the Russians are grooming a candidate on the Democratic ticket. And pretty much wink, wink, nod, nod, through some other comments, you can deduce that this is Tulsi Gabbard. Now, of course, Tulsi Gabbard fought back and attacked Hillary Clinton, and rightly so. I mean, look, any publicity is good publicity. And I'm sure Tulsi Gabbard is very happy to have her name called out by Hillary Clinton uh, and to put herself in the mainstream media because she's basically on the fringe of the stage for these Democratic debates. So if she doesn't get name recognition, if she doesn't get some more money, if she doesn't get up in the polls, she's not going to make it onto another debate stage. So Hillary Clinton just did this woman a huge favor a huge favor, and it's my opinion that of all these you that are standing on that stage, Tulsi Gabbard is quite honestly the only one that I think has a really good chance of beating Donald Trump. I honestly believe this. I think Donald Trump could quite easily mop the floor with Bernie Sanders, with Elizabeth Warren, and with Joe Biden. Any of the others, I just don't think they're going to make it. But Tulsi Gabbard, 
He would have a hard time going after this woman. I honestly believe that. Now, it doesn't mean that that he would lose to Tulsi, but I think Tulsi Gabbard would be uh, the hardest hurdle to jump over for him. Now, who knows? You have Tulsi Gabbard pretty much egging on Hillary Clinton to get back into the race, so this is going to get interesting because we also had some news out today that an investigation conducted by the State Department has pretty much said that Hillary Clinton and her email server and all that crap uh, there was no intentional mishandling of classified information. Now, we'll probably have to do another podcast or at least have a discussion on this at another date. But, uh, you know, does, does this give Hillary Clinton some room on the runway to take off here and to get back into the 2020 presidential campaign? I mean, what a circus that'll be if she throws her hat into the ring because you got Thunder Thumbs Donny Boy egging her on to get back in. And you got Tulsi Gabbard now saying, come on, you want to run your mouth on the sidelines? Why don't you get back in and run against me directly? So this is going to get very, very interesting. Now, this is complete speculation. Maybe Hillary Clinton obviously is doing this on purpose to get back into the race, but to talk about Tulsi Gabbard running as a third-party candidate, which is what she alluded to in her statement. Well, wouldn't that be interesting? If Hillary Clinton were to enter the race... Tulsi Gabbard was, was to run as the Green Party candidate or as an independent and get her name on enough ballots in enough states. And now you got Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and Tulsi Gabbard. Wouldn't that be an interesting outcome? Because you might really have a true three-way race. This could be something like Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, Bush, and Ross Perot, where Ross Perot took a significant amount of votes. That could be the case. So there's a lot of political calculus going on here. Uh, that's speculation. That's a little bit of my spider sense there, too. But we'll see what happens because you still have uh, former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, uh, contemplating entering the race, too. So it's going to be interesting because I don't think Michael Bloomberg will enter the race if Hillary Clinton gets involved. But we'll keep you updated. Um, this this ceasefire, this pause, whatever you want to call it, whether it's semantics, what, you know, whatever, in Turkey, in Syria... Uh, Erdogan is out there again flexing his muscles as we said, as we stated he would because he wants to play the strong man, which is so true of so many other leaders, whether it's in North Korea, China, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson out of the UK. Everybody wants to be the strong guy. So he's, <clears throat> excuse me, he's coming out and saying, look, this is a pause in the action. Uh, the US, the Syrians, the Kurds, the everybody better fall in line and get an agreement with this deal. Otherwise, we're going back to it. And of course, we're going to find out here very shortly uh, through actions what Vladimir Putin and President Erdogan of Turkey are going to be discussing. Because Erdogan will be in, in Russia within a few days talking with Vladimir Putin, and then we will see what actions transpire thereafter as to whether or not Russia ups the ante in Syria if they get more heavily involved or if they say, okay, well, the 120-hour ceasefire is up, that's all you're getting, we're going back to attack the Kurds and take more territory in Syria. So we'll keep you updated on that as well. Uh, the Brexit update, again, not much to report here. If I do a, 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 a week ahead segment on Sunday, we'll know what has transpired tomorrow in UK Parliament, where they are expected to have a vote on um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, his deal that he has arranged with his counterparts with the European Union. Again, the last hurdle now is the vote in Parliament. So we'll keep you posted on that, but I'm not going to bore you with details right now unless and until this thing gets passed or denied. Then we'll have another discussion. And then lastly, before we get to the Boeing story, you know, I just, again, just want to put this in your mind as well. And we talked about this the other day. And let me grab my list of countries around the world that are protesting. You have, obviously, there's still chaos in Iran. There's chaos in Venezuela. We have the Hong Kong protests. We have the Spanish protests. We have them rioting and protesting in Ecuador, in Egypt, in Haiti. And then a couple that I forgot to add to the list is Iraq and also Lebanon. Now, scratching your head, wondering why? This is all economics, ladies and gentlemen. These people can't eat. They're starving. Okay? Some of it's more political. Some of it's a lot, you know, heavily economic. But that's what this is. These are the cracks in the foundation. All right? This is where it starts. The poorest countries. This is an emerging market, developing country crisis that will spread around the rest of the world. And the United States is not an island unto ourselves, and we will feel the ripple effects. We will, just like we are with everything else. Soybeans, pork bellies, 
ain't going to save the day. I don't know how many times I have to say it, but I will gladly say it every day on this podcast until everybody understands this. And if you refuse to believe that, that's fine. Maybe you want to unsubscribe or go listen to somebody else. Or I have a bridge to sell you after the program. Stay tuned. Understand this. Soybeans and pork bellies are not going to save the day. Can it give some confidence? A little bit, but believe me, it is not going to save the day. All of these protests all over the world, the foundation is crumbling, and that's where it starts. Just like here in the United States, last subprime crisis, it was the subprime crisis, the weakest members of the credit community. You're going around the world, you're looking at some of the poorest countries in the world rioting and protesting. This is forecastable. This is predictable. There are big cracks in the foundation. Stay tuned to how this affects the rest of us. Now on to Boeing. The article out of the Wall Street Journal, I will also link this on our website, the Capital News, and my daily run-up that everything I, uh, you know, typically if you're on the website or YouTube or wherever you're, you're listening, uh, I typically do write a daily um, write-up of the podcast to some degree. So this article will be linked in that daily write-up as well, and I hope you take the time to read it despite the fact that I'm going to read it here. Now, just to sort of set the stage as to why this may be a problem or how this came about with the 737 MAX 8 uh, taking shape was Airbus a few years ago, they, they came out and they said, look, we're not going to redesign and make a new airplane. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to create a larger engine. And what we're going to gain out of this is fuel efficiency. And obviously, fuel was a major cost component of the airline industry. So, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars over years could be saved in the airline industry. Well, this is a highly competitive market. You have Airbus and you have Boeing. So Boeing was said, well, we're not going to be outmatched by this. Now, something you have to understand from the outset, and I believe this was the uh, Airbus A320, which is their one of their most popular models, pretty much the workhorse for Airbus, just like the 737 is the workhorse for Boeing. So structurally speaking, some of the differences between these two airlines is the Airbus A320 sits higher from ground, le uh, ground elevation than does the Boeing 737. So there's more clearance between the ground and the wing on the A320 as opposed to the Boeing 737. So this allows for an easier accommodation of the larger engine on the Airbus A320. Okay, you following me? Now, Boeing didn't want to be outdone. So they said, well, we don't want to spend all of the R&D and all of the money to create a new airplane. Let's just replicate what Airbus is doing and put a larger engine on our wings too for the 737. Problem being, ground elevation between the ground and the top of the wing on the 737 is not as high. So now what to do? Well, they said, all right, we still, we're still we going to create this larger engine, which they have, but we can't have it setting under the wing like we normally do. We have to pull the engine forward, and now it actually sits a little bit higher than the wing. Okay? So this can cause a potential problem especially during takeoff of the 737 MAX 8 airline, okay? And the reason being, because you have this larger engine, you can actually cause the plane during takeoff to find itself at a steeper, traject steeper trajectory than what is safe, and this could cause the airline to stall. And if it stalls, you, pilots can lose control, and you crash the airplane. Well, this is exactly what took place last year with Lion Air out of Indonesia, and with Ethi uh, what is it, Air Ethiopia, or Ethiopian Air, uh, same exact thing, because both of these planes crashed shortly after takeoff. Now, the issue that we discussed in the podcast, and what you've likely been hearing on the news is relating to a software glitch. And the reason why the planes are grounded, obviously the safety issue, but is allowing for engineers at Boeing to update the software to make it safe. Because now you have the software updates on the 737 and you also have some other sensors. So if the airplane should find itself at a steeper trajectory, the sensors in conjunction with the software are supposed to kick in to lower the nose of the plane to put it on a safer trajectory. 
okay? Problem being, a lot of pilots were not aware of this software update and that the software would basically take over the airplane. Well, in these two crashes, at least in regards to the Lion Air uh, crash out of Indonesia, the pilots were unable to override the software, and so the plane crashed. In regards to Ethiopian Air, the pilots were able to override the software, but they were too late by the time they gained control, and they weren't able to gain control of the airplane, and they crashed as well. So keep all of this in mind. Take, you know, take a deep breath. There's a lot of information being thrown out there. But again, this is going to be a big story because economically speaking, you have steel, you have rubber, you have aluminum, you have carbon composite materials, you have paint, you have glass, you have computers, you have electronics. The supply chain is massive. And if, if Boeing goes down or suffers a major loss, it will bring with it major, major industries across this country, if not the entirety of this planet. So this is not something to sneeze at, and I'm not being hyperbolic. Just like a, a bank and Lehman Brothers brought down the financial system in conjunction with a whole bunch of things, this can be a catalyst. That's the point. So this is something that we warned about a week or two ago in that podcast. Check that out and pay attention to this as we make our way through, because this can be big information. And it, this is life and death, too. We don't want these corporations fiddling around with revenue and profit at the expense of us. Okay? It's not good and it's not right. So here's the article from the Wall Street Journal. Boeing pilot raised concerns about 737 MAX years before deadly crashes. A senior Boeing company pilot raised concerns about a 737 MAX flight control system three years ago. But the company didn't alert federal regulators until 2019, months after two deadly crashes involving the same system, according to the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. In a 2016 instant message exchange, Mark Forkner, then Boeing's chief technical pilot for the MAX, and a colleague named Patrick Gustafson, appeared to discuss the plane maker's modifications of the system known as MCAS, M MCAS, which is the software system, and the sensors. The pilots compared notes on problems they had encountered in 737 MAX flight simulators, according to a transcript of the messages reviewed by the Wall Street Journal, and Mr. Forkner described some of the MAX's simulated behavior as, quote, egregious. Apparently, referring to changes to the system, Mr. Forkner wrote, quote, so I basically lied to regulators unknowingly, end quote. At the time, FAA regulators were in the process of certifying the 737 MAX as safe to carry passengers. Mr. Gustafson replied, quote, it wasn't a lie. No one told us that that was the case, end quote. According to a letter FAA head Steve Dixon sent to Boeing on Friday, the plane maker discovered the messages in February of this year, several months after a Lion Air 737 MAX crashed in Indonesia and around a month before another of the jets operated by Ethiopian Airlines crashed, killing all on board. But Mr. Dixon's letter said Boeing didn't reveal their existence to the agency until this week and demanded the plane maker provide an immediate explanation for the delay. The messages suggest Boeing's pilots may have encountered some of the problems that eventually led to the two crashes, which together claimed 346 lives. MCAS has been implicated in both crashes. David Greger, I'm sorry, David Gerger, an attorney for Mr. Forkner, said, if you read the whole chat, it is obvious that there was no lie in the simulator program was not operating properly. Based on what he was told, Mark thought the plane was safe and the simulator would be fixed. So here's some finger pointing that this isn't the former chief technical pilot of Boeing, that this is going further up the chain to the bigwigs within Boeing. Continuing, the messages coupled with questions about why they weren't shared earlier with the FAA or congressional investigators intensify scrutiny on Boeing's management and safety culture. They also raise the stakes for Boeing at an October 30th hearing of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Representative Peter DeFazio of Oregon, the Democratic chairman of of the committee has signaled that Boeing Chief Executive Dennis Muhlenberg will be grilled about whether the company misled regulators about MCAS and then withheld relevant documents from investigators. 
Mr. DeFazio said the messages, quote, show deliberate concealment of a problematic system that was on the plane but not included in the training manual. Quote, that's just outrageous. Late Friday, Mr. DeFazio sent a letter to Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow saying he was, quote, deeply troubled by the documents he received because they reflected, quote, improper coziness between the regulator and the regulated. Now, a little aside, who is Elaine Chow? She is the wife of Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate. Get my drift here? Everything's too cozy, folks. Everything's too cozy. Big business and big government. This is not free market capitalism. How many times do I have to tell you? Continuing. After months assessing the relative responsibility of federal regulators and the plane maker in creating the max crisis, Mr. DeFazio said now his probe's focus is shifting way over to the Boeing side. You can't pin this on just this guy, he said, adding that this was a cultural problem. The messages between Mr. Forkner and Gustafson, which were earlier reported by Reuters, highlight issues relating to Boeing's efforts to get the MAX approved smoothly, as well as what pilots were told about MCAS, both topics that congressional investigators and federal prosecutors are focused on, according to people familiar with the probes. The pilots appeared to discuss Mr. Forkner's role in Boeing's craft, crafting pilot MAX manuals, which excluded references to MCAS, after describing the feature, quote, running rampant in the flight simulator, Mr. Forkner wrote, quote, oh great, that means we have to update the speed trim, tri I'm sorry, we have to update the speed trim description in those documents. Speed trim is another flight control system related to MCAS. Investigators have been looking into whether such an update could have alerted FAA officials about the power of MCAS or possibly prompted the agency to mandate additional simulator training for pilots on the new model. Boeing and airlines that bought the MAX, especially Southwest Airlines, there's Southwest again, were determined to persuade the FAA that additional simulator training was not, was not required because MCAS was simply an offshoot of the long-standing speed trim system previously approved by regulators. At the end of the exchange, when the aviators complained that Boeing test pilots failed to alert them about the issues, Mr. Forkner replied, quote, they're all so damn busy in getting pressure from the program. So this is basically Mr. Forkner stating, look, they're getting a lot of pressure from upper management. Again, was Boeing cutting corners for profit. We hope this isn't the case, but this so far this is what this seems to be. Continuing, Boeing is also the subject of a criminal investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice, which is working with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Transportation Department Inspector General's Office to delve into how the 737 MAX aircraft was developed and certified. Last week, the company stripped Mr. Muhlenberg of his dual role as chairman. On Friday, today, Boeing shed $14 billion in market value, with its shares closing down, like we said earlier, 6.8%. It is now trading at $344 a share. Boeing said Mr. Bjolenberg called the FAA chief on Friday to respond to the concerns raised in his letter, and the company reiterated it will continue to cooperate with the House panel. Well, they have no choice now, do they? Continuing. A Boeing spokesman said the company didn't believe it was appropriate to share the document with the FAA sooner because of the ongoing criminal investigation. The spokesman said Boeing shared it with the FAA's parent agency on Thursday because it planned to turn the letter over to congressional investigators on Friday. Separately, the FAA provided Mr. DeFazio's committee with a batch of emails covering the period from 2015 to 2018 between Mr. Forkner and an unidentified FAA official dealing with Max issues. In one day to January 17, 2017, with the name of the agency recipient blacked out, Mr. Forkner wrote about deleting any mention of MCAS from certain manuals or computer-based training for pilots. Quote, we decided we weren't going to cover it, the email said, quote, since it's way outside the normal operating envelope, end quote, and therefore pilots wouldn't be expected to experience it. Ten months earlier, according to another email, Mr. Forkner raised the same issue telling another unidentified FAA official the system was, quote, completely transparent to the flight crew. 
Boeing provided the instant messages to the Justice Department in February after discovering them, and then to the Department of Transportation's General Counsel on Thursday night, before giving the same information to congressional committees investigating the MAX, according to a person familiar with the matter. The FAA is part of the Transportation Department. The Justice Department was informed Boeing would hand over the information to other agencies, according to this source. Continuing, we will continue to follow the direction of the FAA and other global regulators as we work to safely return the 737 MAX to service, Boeing said, adding that the company shared the documents with the appropriate authorities in a timely manner. A Justice Department spokesman declined to comment about why the agency didn't notify aviation regulators about the exchange. Mr. Forkner served as an important liaison among Boeing, FAA officials vetting the new model, and managers at Southwest, the MAX's lead customer, which was establishing training programs to serve as templates for the rest of the industry. Mr. Forkner left Boeing in 2018 and now works for Southwest. An attorney for Mr. Gustafson, who succeeded Mr. Forkner in his old role and is still at Boeing, couldn't be reached. A Senate panel is also likely to hold a hearing discussing Max later this month. Senator Richard Blumenthal, Democrat of Connecticut, said he wanted to question Mr. Muhlenberg and Boeing's board of directors about the instant messages, which he said portray, portrayed, quote, a decrepit culture of corruption in safety, end quote. And that's the end of the article. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Is the cover-up worse than the crime? Usually that's the case in politics. Sometimes in politics it means that somebody's dead. Other times it doesn't. Here we obviously have the loss of life. 346 individuals uh, in an aircraft, the same model, that went down within six months of each other. Lion Air out of Indonesia, and then obviously... Uh, Ethiopia Air in Ethiopia. So there is a lot to be mindful of here. I again ask that you take the time to check out that earlier podcast titled GE and GM Trouble at the Plant, where we also covered in-depth Boeing. And now today's podcast is Boeing taking off or are they nosediving? Because this will be a shot heard around the world. Make no mistake about it, because this could shoot in the foot their credibility. This is life and death. Again, this, this is not a toaster oven. This is not an iPhone. This is life and death. Are you going to get on these airplanes again? Are you going to send your loved ones on these airplanes again? This is a big deal. And if it's found that this company, Boeing, cut corners, put revenue and profit in front of safety, this, it, it will take years to gain back that credibility if they even exist after this. And again, I'm not being hyperbolic. This is serious stuff. Now, I hope that's not the case. I hope this is just a software glitch. I hope it's not a structural engineering problem. I don't want to see tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people lose their jobs. Because I'm telling you, this will decimate the manufacturing base in this country. And with it, a whole bunch of secondary and indirect uh, professions that go with it. So this is something to keep, not in the back of your mind, but in the front of your mind. And when you have a big company like this, who is also very much a part of the military-industrial complex, Boeing is a major contributor to the defense budget, okay? They are awarded a ton of contracts from Uncle Sam, all right? So Uncle Sam may extend an emergency loan to Boeing if they have to. So we're going to be bailing them out, quite potentially. A lot of things to pay attention to. This is interconnected. Pay attention. Stay diversified and stay with the Capital News. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. I hope to be back on Sunday with some updates. Who knows what I'll be updating on? There's so much crap going on, but stay tuned. Thank you so much for joining me. I am Alex Kreitis. Godspeed.